And uh, the fact that uh, most of you people have attended, it's not lost on me, so I thank you. Thank you for that. Um, remember, on Monday is our exam, right? It's coming Monday. It starts at 8 o'clock, and it ends at 10.30 sharp. We're not going to stay late, so don't be late. Um, I actually made up the exam this morning, and I brought it with me, so don't kill me on the way out. I don't remember to get a copy of it. I only brought one with me. So. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the exam, as you know, will be on chapters 10, 9, and 8. 8, 9, and 10. If you missed a class in the last couple of weeks, you can always watch them on that yeah, YouTube uh, channel that they set up for this class. That Each class is recorded. And... I brought the problems that we worked on uh, two or three classes ago. Maybe we'll continue working on those today for practice. And here's just a word of uh, advice. When you come for the exam, by the way, you're going to need those tables that are in the back of the book, you know, the Z and the T and you know, the F and, and all that kind of stuff. So don't come without your book or... If you're one of the crazy students who hasn't purchased a book all semester, God bless you, um, you can probably get those tables out of a book in the library, a statistics book, and copy them and bring them with you. Or you could bring a, a, a computer or a laptop, log on to the internet, and uh, probably see those tables somewhere online if you said t table or z table or whatever i'm sure they're online somewhere but that's going to be on you guys because um, you'll you need that the other thing that you're going to need is something to do the calculations on so a little cheap calculator or your phone will work just fine all right if you don't have that i don't know how you'll be able to get through this uh, exam Okay, so the, you should have your book, that's number one. But if you don't, at the very least, you should have the tables that we've been referring to, the F and T and Z and all those kinds of things, and, um, and some way to calculate. And by the way, uh, laptops have calculators on them, right? You can get an online calculator. So if you have a laptop, you can do that, all right? You're welcome to do, to do that in class. Um, now, let me just tell you a little bit about the exam here. There are three questions on the exam, one from each chapter, okay? One from chapter nine, eight, one from nine, one from 10. There's no tricks. I mean, we've uh, gone over this stuff a lot, so I'm hoping you'll be okay. Uh, here's what I, what I wrote for the instructions, and I, I think it's just easy for me to read them to you now. So it says, each question, and since there are three, valued at 33.33 points, each question. But for the first two questions, I will give partial credit because there's five parts to question one and five to question number two. And so each of those parts is about 6.6 .6 or, seven, say, 7 uh, points. If you do the math, that's what it comes out to. So you can get some points if you get some of the uh, answers correct in questions one or two. The third question, though, you will not get partial credit for. You'll either get it right or wrong, and that's worth 33 points. And that one is based on the stuff we've been doing for the last several classes on the analysis of variance, in particular that problem 10.2 type of a problem. Right, uh, And so if, if you understand what we've been talking about and the examples in the book that we worked through last time and the example at the end of the chapter, you'll be able to do question three. All right? Um, and for, for whenever I ask you to do calculations or anything like that, I want you to be neat. If I have to you know, go blind trying to figure out what you're saying, I won't give you credit for that. But no reason not to just be neat and orderly and do what you got to do, all right? And by the way, if you're neat and orderly, you'll do great, um, if you, as opposed to if you're sloppy, confused, or disorganized, or, or whatever. I think two and a half hours is plenty of time for the, uh, for the test, and um, 
and maybe you won't need all that time, but uh, I think it's pretty easy. By the way, in the last class I mentioned again, and I'll mention it again now, make sure you really understand the symbols that we've been talking about, right? The symbols, uh, remember in the last K, it stands for categories, simple things. Um, make sure you understand uh, how to write a null hypothesis, right? And everything will count on that. So for example, when you're writing a null hypothesis, we always put the little zero, right, underneath it. And so make sure you understand how to, how to state that in symbols, right? Um, the alternative hypothesis, which is the one the researcher's interested in, right? After you either reject or accept that, you can make a decision about this. Make sure you understand how to write that symbolically, okay? Um, and I'm actually, you know, like I said, I, I made this up at uh, 5 o'clock this morning. And um, by the way, we're going to use only alphas of 0.05, okay? We're not going to use any other weird alphas for doing uh, hypothesis testing. Remember also when you went back, well, it was a while ago in uh, chapter 8, I guess it was, um, when we were calculating critical regions, like where what it marks the beginning of a critical region, what score, that it mattered whether it was a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. Why does that matter? I'm going back now to chapter 8, but why does that matter if, I, if we want to understand what score, what z-score, marks the beginning of the critical region, right? Why does it matter? Uh, why do you need to understand or know that it's a two-tailed test? For example, if, uh, if I said to you, we have a two-tailed test and the alpha is, uh, is 0 0.05, we use that a lot in class, right? If the alpha is 0 0.05 and we have a two-tailed test, is the critical region the same number as if we had a one-tailed test with an alpha of 0.05? It's not the same, is it? Right? So how would you find, if it was a two-tailed test and the alpha was 0 0.05, what, thing, what step do you need to do mathematically to even begin to be able to look at the table in the back of your book and understand what to do? If it's a two-tailed test and the alpha is 0.05 or 0.10 or whatever the heck it is, right? But it's a two-tailed test. What's the first step that you have to think about? Anybody know? You have to divide it by two. Right. Simple. But maybe not so simple if you're sitting there taking the test and you can't, right? Just kind of let's go through some of these easy things that won't be roadblocks, right? And so, and if it's a one-tailed test, obviously you don't have to divide by two. And if it's a two-tailed test, by the way, right, an alpha with a two-tailed test at 0 0.05 is going to have a smaller shaded area or a smaller critical region than if you had a one-tailed test where the critical region would be bigger. Does that not make sense to you? Because if it doesn't, we should draw a picture on the board. Does it not make sense to anybody? Everybody's perfectly clear on that? All right. And, um, and remember, I've been saying this a lot too, but when you're calculating a test statistic, you're calculating the obtained score, the score that you're trying to obtain. So when somebody says to you, calculate the test of a statistic, and you're doing a a problem related to the Z table or the T table or the F table. When somebody says, hey, calculate the, uh, the test statistic, you're really calculating, and we said this last time, Z obtained or T obtained or F obtained, right? So the test statistic is the same as the obtained score. So we have two concepts that we always have to think about here. One is the test statistic or T, Z, or F obtained, and the other one is the critical region, T, Z, or F, critical, right? The score that marks that critical region.
You know, in chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, there are, each of those chapters addresses a particular topic. Chapter 8 addresses a, a testing a hypothesis with one sample and comparing it to the population. You may remember that famous example that we talked a lot about in the book was the example where there was an alcohol treatment program and people were worried or concerned about whether that had a positive or a negative impact on, on absenteeism. So chapter 8 talked about a one-sample test. Chapter 9 talked about a two-sample hypothesis test. And chapter 10 talks about three or more, right? Each of those chapters is, and each of those uh, items, hypothesis test one sample, hypothesis test two samples, hypothesis test um, three or more, each of those is associated with a different probability distribution, meaning a different table in the back of the book, right? Each of those chapters. So roughly speaking, chapter eight would be like the Z table, and chapter Nine would be the T tables, right? That's what the, the book uh, was talking about. And chapter 10 would be the F tables, right? Those tables are probability distributions. I don't use that phrase to try to trick you or anything uh, on the exam or in life, but they are probability distributions. And so it's important to know which table you're using for what kind of problem you're looking at. And when you're looking at the problem, you should be saying, hey, is this a, a one sample hypothesis test or a two sample or three or more, right? You should be able to determine that so that you'll get on the right track to work through the problems. Those are the points that I think if you understand what we just said, you should do smashingly on this um, exam. You should do okay. Um, the, uh, but it's important, make sure you're, you have something to do your calculations on. You're not going to get through it by hand. I mean, none of the math is hard, but for example, and don't put your telescopes on or anything like that, but there's one problem that has a lot of little numbers, right? So you'll drive yourself crazy square in each of those and, and all that if you don't have a calculator or your phone that you can do squares on or a computer that you can use or something like that. All right? Um, again, you'll, you'll need the tables that are in the back of the book. And, um, and by the way, a great way to study for this would be to go through the chapters. In each of the chapters, there was... A great, and we did it last class too, but in each of the chapters, this and the way the whole book is laid out, the author works through a problem and shows you step by step. And then, of course, you're asked to do some problems at the end of the chapter. Um, I'm now looking in chapter eight, for example. If you can work through, I've been saying this to you as we discuss them in class, work through them and prove it to yourself. If you could really work through these, a problem, the sample problems in each of the chapters, uh, you'll be able to to do the uh, the exams very well. Um, you know, there's formulas in each chapter and so on and so forth, but applying the formulas becomes critical. Um, and let me see where the good example is here. Ah, okay, um, around page 195 to page 200 in uh, the chapter in chapter eight, uh, there's a problem. Work through it. Make sure you can do that type of a problem, right? In chapter nine, let's see if we could find that one. Again, there are tons of formulas on page 219 in chapter nine. They're great. You have to understand them and so on and understand what the symbols mean, etc. But there's a, an example that follows uh, formula 9.4. It begins on page 219. And, um, 
and, and the author works you through the steps, uh, walks you or works you, whichever phrase you want to use, right? And it shows you the, the obtained score, the critical score. Work through those problems. Make sure you understand you know, how the work was done. Also on page 222, um, the applying statistics, 9.1. Work through that. Make sure you understand why those numbers are what they are. Okay? So there are several of those examples in each chapter that are really important. I mean, there are no questions on here, for example, about type 1 and type 2 errors. I'm not going back to that. That, were in pre that was in chapter 8 and so on, or 9, excuse me. Um, I was more interested in having, as I've been saying, work through a problem or answer a conceptual question and so on. Because if you can do that, you really are getting it. You're really starting to get this stuff. Okay. Any questions? Okay, another great way to practice uh, would be to, to continue our work on problem 10.2. Now, I brought the work that you started last time so you can continue on these, okay? By the way, if you came in late, you better find out what I said by watching the video or talking to somebody, okay? Um, this Pass those down, please. I'll get back to you. Would you give this to Dakota? By the way, this is an important one to understand because this is the question that I mentioned that you'll get either full credit or no credit for. So it, uh, it's the third question on the exam. All right, Randall. Here the day we worked on these, we're doing problem 10.4 at the end, okay, of the chapter. Jasmine. Try to kind of remember what we did. Problem 10.2 on page 267. Right? And what you did is you set up the table, by the way, which is uh, really important for you to stay organized, okay? Um, set up, you guys, most of you set up the table quite nicely. Just to refresh your memory. And, and I think all of you kind of did this. But we had a score column and a square, score squared for each one, right? But 
and remember, this is the question on the exam that's worth 33 points. So it's important that you stay organized. And then um, most of you, if not all of you, wrote the appropriate numbers that uh, needed to be written that are in the book, in the problem, that are given to you in the problem, right? And then we started to calculate the total sum of the squares, which is SST, right? <coughs> we calculate the uh, SST and, um, and get that number and so on. What's the next step that we have to do? It's, so, so this is really important. It's probably, well, it's more important than even the math if we don't know what to do next. After we calculated SST, remember, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to find the test statistic, right? To see if there is a significant difference between those educational levels and what was it, uh, church attendance or, right? Cert attending services, right? That's what we're trying to do. So we have three categories, <laughs> so three samples. Obviously, that's more than two. So there are three, and remember, three or more, we're using analysis of variance, right? By the way, which table does that, do we, are, are we worried about with this one? Fifth. Huh? Fifth. I can't hear you. The F table? Yeah, that's right. The F table. And by the way, remember the F table is going to tell us, if we do this right, it's going to help us to find the score that marks the critical region, the beginning of the critical region, the shaded area. That's what that table, any of these tables will tell us, right? As well as some other things. So you, you calculated SST, right? which is the total sum of the squares. Right? What is the next step? What do we have to calculate next? Take a look in your book. Yes, Max? It's going to be SSB. SSB, right. We have to calculate the sum of the squares between. Right? After we calculate SSB, what do we have to calculate? There's only one left, right? SSW, right. So sum of the squares between and the sum of the squares within. Remember, sum of the squares between tells us something about the magnitude or the significance of the differences between the categories, between B, right? And the SSW tells us something about the spread or the dispersion within each category, right? That's what that tells us. All right, so let's go back, by the way, and well, on the, actually, it's on the previous page. It's nice and convenient. On page 266, there is a summary of all of the formulas in this chapter. Right? So which one are we interested in next? Last class, you were interested in 10.1, right? Which one are we interested in now? I'm looking at the bottom of page 266. Which formula? 10.3, right. SSB equals, right, the, the N, the sum of the, the N for the category times the mean for the category minus the, the grand mean or the overall mean, right, squared. So let's see if we can do that with the numbers that you've been working with. And, uh, and if you weren't here the day we were working on it, um, it's on page 267, problem 10.2. The numbers are stated there again. 
But I think we worked through this rather nicely for those of you who did work on it, and most of you did in that last class. So let's see if we can apply um, formula 10.3 to the numbers. What I'll do, because you, some of you obviously don't have the book and so on, um, is I'm going to write these numbers up here, and then maybe you can work through them. So if you weren't here in the last class, the next thing you need to do is that, all right? N for this whole mess is 15, right? You have to also calculate the grand mean, which is the mean for all of the scores. You'll need all these numbers, right? God bless you. Each category, by the way, these are the Ks, right? done? Oh, question? Yeah. What are you asking me? This is the sum of the, the, of the category. were 16 total, right? Good question. <clears throat> N subscript K, right, is the number of scores in the category, one, two, three, or five, for example, right? Right? Got that? This would be one that we'd have N, K, two, N, K, three. If that helps, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't.
Now remember, you have to do that calculation for each category, and if, if you want to be reminded, you could look at page 260 and see the way the author worked through the sample that he was giving you. If you're quick at working through this, um, what's the? Uh, you keep working on it. We're not in a rush here. But what's the? After you calculated S S B, right? Now you have to do S S W, right? Which is the easy one. SSB and SSW. And then after you do that, and again, I hope I'm not interrupting you, keep doing your work, but for those who are finished, or maybe finished, maybe one or two of you, what is the next step after we, we got SSB, we've calculated SSW, what do we have to do next? Think about it. Oh, say it loud so everybody can hear it. Start. DFW. Right. The degrees of freedom within the category and the degrees of freedom between the categories. Right. We need those numbers too. And by the way, once you get all those numbers, you got all the numbers that you're going to need. You start plugging them in like crazy. And for the DFW formula, the N is 15, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 15 scores, 15 items, right? And of course, K, we all know, is the number of categories, right?
I'm just going to talk while you're working, okay? But, so you already calculated SST, the total sum of the squares. Then just now you did SSB, the sum of the squares between. And you may be still working on this, but then SSW, which is the score you figured out in the last class, which I think was 35.21 if I'm not mistaken, minus what you just calculated today for the SSB, right? That gives you that. Then you do your degrees of freedom, right? And then if you look at formula 10.7, and formula 10.8, right? Those are two very important final steps before the big final step, right? You take what you found for SSW and divide it by DFW. And then you, and, uh, formula 10.8, you use the number in the numerator for the SSB that you just calculated and then divide that by the degrees of freedom, the DFB, right? And then when you're done with all of that, you go to formula 10.9, which is on, again, we're all on page 266. And you do the calculation for the test statistic, which in this case is called F obtained, right? And I saw you go into the back of the book, so you probably were right there, right? And so once you get F obtained, then what? Was it page 451, I think, in the back of your book, the F table for an alpha of 0.05, right? You went to the back of the book, and you had to look at the degrees of freedom within and the degrees of freedom between, right? Looking across the top, you find your degrees of freedom between. Down the side, you look within. You find out what the critical area is, right? And then you see is if your F obtained or your test statistic is bigger or smaller, right? What's that? Am I going to ask about the table? Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to. You'll have to be able to use the table. Okay. Like here is one point one. Right. And then I look at these two, right? Yep. Yeah. And then do one right here. What I. Well, you're going to look up. You're going to look up your degrees of freedom right. here, right? So where are your degrees of freedom? One. Oh, you're, you're using right. Here. Here's your degrees of freedom here, this and here, mm -hmm. and that there. Then you look down the column. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about those. You, you use the de degrees of freedom between. Mm -hmm. All right. Between and within. So what do we have? Two, of course, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then what's within? This one's two. No. Right. This is two. And this is within is 12. Where is it? I can't see it upside down. 3. Point, what is it? 3.88. 3.88. That sound about right for you guys, right? So 3.88 is the beginning of the critical area, right? Right? What was your test statistic? 0.79. Where is it? 0.795. Does that sound right? What you guys got? All right, by the way, that's a lot smaller, isn't it, than three, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Remember, when you're using the table in the back of the book, you got to go back to your 
numbers that you found for DFB and DFW in order for the table in the back of the book to make sense, right? When you do that, you know, across the top and down the side, you'll come up with a number. The number, the correct number that we came up with was 3.88, right? Yes. What did they say they got for the um, F of Zane? I didn't do the calculation. They're saying they got 0.79 or something like that. What did you get for F of 10? 0.795. What did you get, Star? I got 6.00. Well, if, by the way, if, if that's correct, and it may be, if that's correct, that's deep into the critical region, right? Yeah. And so you would reject the null hypothesis. If your 7.9 is correct, right, then you would not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, by the way, what you got is probably a function. If you, if, you, if you got a weird number, I think you all know how to do the steps. It probably just was hitting the wrong button or something like that. All right? Any questions? Now, by the way, work through the chapter again. Um, that problem, the sample in the chapter. Make sure you understand the numbers, where they go, OK? If you can do that, you will get the third question 100% correct, and that's worth 33.33 points, OK? I thank you very much for a nice semester. Um, as tough as it was, I guess at 8 o'clock in the morning for you guys, I uh, appreciate it. And um, I'll see you Monday, 8 o'clock sharp. We end at 10.30 sharp on Monday, right? Okay, in this room.